But let's look at x momentum. We'll go through and derive the x momentum equation, and from that, we'll infer what the y and z momentum component equations would be. And so I'm going to have to evaluate, in order to look at those terms where momentum is carried in and out of the control volume, the momentum that is carried through the faces. It's going to be a little bit easier to look at this in 2D, uh, but we'll look at all the terms and derive the equation in three dimensions as well. So if this is a 2D slice of my control volume, where I have an x plus face here and an x minus face here, what I want, the, the rate at which momentum is carried out through that face, the rate is going to make it the mass flow rate, m dot. Instead of the mass, it's the rate. So that's kilograms per second instead of kilograms, and that makes it a rate. And to get the momentum, we multiply it by the velocity that is on this face, ux plus. And I can expand that m dot. It's, of course, rho times the velocity times the area of this face. An x face has an area dy dz. And so this term here is my mass flow. And I need to multiply it by the velocity at the face in order to get the momentum, the rate at which momentum is carried through this face. I can do the same thing at the x minus face. And all I'm doing is saying now the velocity is evaluated at the x minus face. The velocity that I'm multiplying the mass flow by to get the momentum is the, is the velocity in the x minus face. And the same thing now for the x momentum carried through the y face. And notice on the y faces, of course, it's the v component of the velocity which is perpendicular to the surface and carries mass through it, but I'm interested in the x component of the momentum, and so I need to multiply the mass flow rate by the u component of the velocity so that I have the rate at which x momentum is carried through this face. Same thing for the minus direction. So because it's x momentum, we're always multiplying by the u component, and it's being carried by a mass flow. We have to evaluate that mass flow correctly on each face. Let's look at those terms in more detail. So here I have repeated what I had on the previous slide. At the x plus face, we're looking at this face here in three dimensions, and there's our term there. We can go through and look at all six of these faces and write very similarly an equation for all of these, evaluating the mass flow rate. In this case, it's the x minus face times the u component of the velocity to get the x momentum. And when we look at the y faces, of course, we need the perpendicular component of the velocity to evaluate the mass flow rate, but we still need the u component to get the x momentum. Same with the z faces. There's the z plus face. This is the z plus face here. We need the w component on the z plus face in order to evaluate the mass flow through that face but we still multiply it by the u component of the velocity to get the x momentum that the mass flow carries out of that face. Now we need to evaluate these instead of just saying they're evaluated on the x plus face, for example. Here's the x plus face. And of course I do that just like I did in conservation of mass by using a Taylor series expansion. So the value of the momentum going through the x face, so rho u times the area gives me the mass flow rate, Multiplying it by u gives me the momentum in the x direction. And knowing it at the center, and I want to move it to this face, so I need to look at the rate of change of that same quantity multiplied by the distance that I'm moving to get to that face, dx over 2. Both of those, of course, multiplied by the area of the face uh, to get what we had on the previous slide. On the x minus face, it's identically the same, except that I move a distance minus dx over 2, so we see a negative sign appearing there. And of course, on this face, the way I've defined my velocity vectors here, it's coming into the control volume, whereas on this face, it's going out of the control volume. So I've labeled that here so that we can add that together into our equation with the correct sign. On the y face, the same thing, except of course to move from the center to the y plus face, I need to go in the y direction, and I'm moving a distance dy over 2. The y minus face down here is in the minus dy over 2, a distance of minus dy over 2 from the center, and the z faces are a distance dz over 2 from the center, or minus dz over 2 from the center. And so those are all six of those terms carrying x momentum through the six faces of my three-dimensional Cartesian control volume. So let's put that together. You'll notice that in these terms, the rate of, of increase of momentum mu, mass times the u component of the velocity in the control volume, 
the rate of increase is, of course, simply the der time derivative of that rho u times the volume dx dy dz. The rate that it's leaving are those three faces that were going out on the previous slide. So I can write this expression here for the faces going out, and those are going to be positive. So there it is for the x faces, there it is for the y faces, there it is for the z faces coming directly off the previous slide. The faces which are entering the control volume carry a negative sign, and of course all of those faces that were entering the control volume were a distance minus dx over 2 minus dy over 2 minus dz over 2 from the center of the control volume, so I get that negative sign that was there as well. Now notice what's going to happen. These, this term appears twice, and it's both positive, but I'm subtracting one of them, and so this is going to cancel out, this is going to cancel out, this is going to cancel out, but the remaining term, I have a negative and a negative, and so these two half terms are going to add to a full term. And once again, as in the case of mass conservation, I will end up, I have a dx for moving to the face, and the area is a dy dz. Here I have a dy for moving to the y faces, but the area is a dx dz, and similarly here, so I will get a dx dy dz in each of these terms. So when I simplify that, and I combine the rate of momentum in the u direction, leaving the CV minus entering the CV, I get this nice simplified expression here. And of course, every term was multiplied by dx dy dz. Now I will want to divide that by the volume because both of those are divided by the volume. And so I'm left with this term here representing the rate of change of momentum per unit volume in my control volume. This term here, the rate per unit volume at which momentum is the net rate at which momentum is carried out minus in. And of course, I've divided by the volume. So on this side now, I have the sum of the forces applied to the control volume per unit volume. So there's my equation here. And now we get into some of that math that we need to simplify it. So let's look at some calculus. All of these terms you'll notice are products of three variables. I'm going to keep them grouped into two, but we can apply the chain rule of calculus so that a term that is rho u u, taken with respect to x, can be expanded to be a velocity u component times the x derivative of rho u, plus what's inside there, rho u times the derivative of the one we had out there. That's just the chain rule of calculus. We could apply it similarly for this term and for this term, and that will expand our equation out, where you'll notice that one term in this expansion is always multiplied by the u because we're looking at the x momentum equation and the other term is multiplied by a rho because we had a rho u in there and so we'll always have this rho in there so if i separate these terms we're taking this term here and rewriting it here and applying the chain rule to each of these three terms and so we're going to end up with six terms when we do that and there they are there and you'll notice now that a bunch of these terms as i just said are multiplied by u and a bunch of them are multiplied by rho. So let's collect those terms, and we get this expression here, multiplying u, and these three terms here being multiplied by rho. There's one more chain rule we can apply, and that's the one that's coming from this time derivative, or the rate of change of momentum inside the volume itself. I can expand it like this and see again that I have a term that's multiplying rho, multiplied by rho, and a term that's multiplied by u. And so I can pop this one down into here with the three that we had here. So I can break the term that comes from the rate of change of momentum in the volume itself using the chain rule of calculus and find myself having a term that is multiplied by rho and another term that is multiplied by u. And I can add those to the three terms that we had multiplied respectively by those variables in order to break this entire term here into this expression here. So this is the state of our equation at this point. If you've been looking carefully, you're going to notice something. And that is that this expression here is exactly the conservation of mass equation that we derived in the previous video. And that being the case means that this term is by definition equal to zero, and all of those terms will disappear for us. That was the point of doing those expansions, is that we could get rid of a bunch of these terms. Now we're left with only the four terms that were multiplied by the density, and we still have the force per unit volume. Again, this term is our inertia force. It is our mass times acceleration term uh, divided by the volume, and hence we have the forces per unit volume on the other side. 
And you might notice again that this term here is the definition of the total or material derivative that we came up with in another video as well. And so I can simplify that directly to rho times the material derivative du dt, being able to sum of the forces per unit volume. And I just want to point out, of course, we have a separate video on the material derivative and the acceleration in the Eulerian frame of reference. But I just want to point out that that came up very naturally in this derivation because we were looking at those flows of momentum out and in, of the, in from the control volume. And that is exactly the process of converting from the Lagrangian frame where we're watching the particles and we're following those fixed masses moving through the system to the Eulerian frame when we're looking at things at a point and having those masses or particles pass by us at that point. And so it's not surprising that that um, naturally emerged from this derivation. And so, of course, that also means that we could have shortened this video dramatically because I could have immediately done this conversion in one step by realizing that if I want to go from the fixed mass system, and I have my time derivative of this quantity here, and I want to convert it to an Eulerian system, of course, I need to change this into the, uh, into the material derivative in order to look at this at a point in my Eulerian frame of reference. And because this is a fixed mass, I could have just pulled it out of this derivative the same way I just put it in there at the beginning uh, when we came up with this equation. Because the mass is constant, I can move it in and out of a derivative operator. And I want to remind you once again, you can go back and look at that video, but the acceleration in the Eulerian frame because of that conversion does not just have time components. We have seen this emerge again in this derivation but it's got these spatial components here. So even in a steady flow, when the time derivatives are all zero, the acceleration does not have to be zero. All of these terms have to be zero if we're going to say there's no acceleration or there's no inertia force in the flow.